You're listening to the BBM Global Network with 25 years in broadcast audio and video production. Our passionate team creates content and marketing for the world of Internet talk radio. If you've got a passion, come join us at BBMGlobalNetwork.com. The BBM Global Network. Your voice is now heard. Used to be an addict, now he's substance free. Telling all about his crazy journey. Take off that mask and take on your addiction. Alan Charles, author and keynote speaker on drug abuse and prevention, and the host of The Alan Charles Show, is here to bring hope to the hopeless as he shares his unbelievable luck at surviving a 24 year drug addiction. Alan's raw honesty and courageous heart breaks the stigma of addiction and offers a unique perspective into the mind of an addict. So now, please welcome the host of The Alan Charles Show, Alan Charles. He's given us the real story, The Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory, The Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory. The Alan Charles Show. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I am your host, Alan Charles, and we are here every Thursday evening at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time where we talk about addiction recovery and all the things that go with it. And we give it to you the real way. We talk about it and we say that you get addiction, recovery, and reality here. And I come out from behind the mask and I let you know what it's like to have a 24-year cocaine addiction. And it was miraculous. I was lucky that I, I hear all of you that uh, join me every week know my story. I'll give you the abbreviated version for those of you that are joining in for the first time. Uh, I had a really wonderful life. I was very fortunate, grew up uh, early on in a loving family, and uh, eventually worked my way down to play some baseball in college, played a year professionally. And then at 24 years old, after a series of different things happened to me, uh, kind of traumatic things, I was in a very vulnerable place. And somebody, a friend who I didn't know was a cocaine dealer, uh, would consistently ask me, hey, why don't you try a line? Hey, come on, let's do a line together. And, you know, I got to a point where I just I wasn't interested. It was the last thing. In the back of my mind, I had no desire or interest to do drugs. Just that wasn't me. Well, I was at this really vulnerable place. I was 24 years old. I had just gotten out of an engagement with the first person that I was ever in love with, uh, feeling the loss of baseball. And this guy comes by and offers me a line of cocaine. And I try it. I was weak. I said yes. And from that point on, I believed that I was addicted to cocaine. I took that very first line, and when I snorted it and I tilted my head back, I could feel that start dripping down my throat. And I had had a knot in my stomach. I was filled with anxiety, especially it started, which I'm going to talk tonight about. Tonight is going to be talking about that age of nine years old for me when my life fell apart. But I had this knot in my stomach. I lost my father at age nine. So all of a sudden, I do cocaine for the very first time. And as I'm have my as I have my eyes closed and my head tilted back, it starts dripping down my throat, and I get this sense of euphoria, and I'm like, "Oh my God, where has this stuff been?" 
And at that point, my life just changed instantaneously. That knot just disappeared. And from that point on, that began a love affair with cocaine that lasted 24 years. I lost everything because of my addiction. And uh, we're going to talk a lot more about what this did to me. But uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, It was pretty miraculous. Somehow I was able to find the program of recovery. And uh, I am now sober over 11 years and about... I don't know, four or five years, four years ago, um, I finished writing a memoir. And the name of my book is called Walking Out the Other Side, An Addict's Journey from Loneliness to Life. And if you Google Walking Out the Other Side, you'll see stuff all over the place. And it's uh, my tale of my 24-year cocaine addiction. And then through all the things that I've been doing out and about talking to high schools and colleges and businesses about the dangers of drug and alcohol addiction. Uh, And through my social media postings, and I have a YouTube channel, uh, Bold Brave Media found me and uh, gave me a show, and here we are. So I'm really excited to be here with you as I shared last week, and we had some technical problems, so hopefully everybody is back with us this week. But what I shared was we re-signed. This was the beginning of our new season, and I will be with you for the next 72 weeks, and I am here to guide you, your family, your loved ones, anybody that needs help with addiction and to face reality. This is where they need to come, and this is what they need to listen to, and we take questions, call-ins. You can email me questions. I make myself available to my audience to help them in any way that I can possibly help them. You could start off if you want to call, you want to talk about something. My call-in number is 866-451-1451, and those of you that our regulars here at the Alan Charles show. I already have questions. And again, the topic is going to be, we're going to be talking about nine-year-old Alan Charles. And I'm going to share with you how my life fell apart. Uh, If you have, some people have read my book. They also have sent questions. So uh, this is set up to be a really exciting show. Uh, There was a couple of things that uh, I wanted to talk to you about that uh, I ran in, I guess, like our current events section. Now, uh, I am looking when this show began. I want to talk about a new show on HBO. Now, I have not seen it, but I have seen the trailer. The name of the show is Euphoria. Um. And Euphoria is on HBO, and it explores addiction, trauma, and all the different things that go on in high school. So let's see. Let's see what it says about this show. It says, teens today have access to the world in a way many of us never experienced in our formative years. Drugs, sex, relationships portrayed in the show are absolutely something we see on a regular basis. It is no wonder why HBO's new drama, Euphoria, has already been renewed for a second season. The riveting series is a non-holds-barred look at overstimulated teens who use drugs, deal with childhood trauma, have sex. It's a perfect recipe for must-see TV. I I don't even know where to go with this. This, wow. First of all, I can tell you I have palpitations because of everything that I read. I I can't even envision what I would have been like in high school had I been, if I had found drugs and alcohol, I would have been an absolute mess. So I can't even imagine what this show is going to be like. And and I'm going to have to test it here. Uh, The creator of the show is Sam Levison. He's struggled with addiction as a teen, and he talks all about it. You know what? We're going to take a quick break. I will finish up telling you about this show. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and we will be right back. 
Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a passionate book that tells the true story of author Rhonda Knudsen's journey through the darkness and adversity of abuse. The book takes readers on an emotional trail from the depths of despair to the heights of forgiveness and understanding. She was inspired to help others, and her book is a vital tool through this process. Faithful to God and devotional to her beacon of hope, Rhonda Knudsen is a perfect example of finding a guiding light that helped her come through the dark and into the light. Her book can assist you in overcoming your challenges with abuse. The publication of Escape from Hell, A Woman's Story is a triumphant achievement, and it can help you take ownership of your own experience of abuse and come through stronger than before. Rhonda is currently working on two more books, Shadows of Corruption and Coast to Coast on a Piece of Toast. To read more about this inspiring author and purchase her books, visit RhondaKnutson.com or go to www.amazon.com. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like... I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416 529 7429. Energetic Magic. On the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network in Tuna Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, I was telling you about a new show that uh, is on HBO called Euphoria. And uh, (laughs) boy, it's sure different than when I grew up as a teen. It talks about, you know, teens having access in a world in the way that we never experienced it. There's drugs, there's sex, there's relationships portrayed in the show. And it seemed like that on a regular basis. So this is basically a no holds barred look at overstimulated teens. And they actually show the drug use, dealing with childhood trauma, they have sex. And it's a, as they say in this little article, it's a perfect recipe for must-see TV. And it, it absolutely is. And uh, there's uh, the creator, who uh, is somebody who's been around television for a long time, Sam Levinson, uh, also spoke about his struggling with addiction as a teen. And uh, he was pretty involved, and uh, he ended up just kind of quitting blank, like uh, cold turkey. He he said that he remembered speaking. What did he do? He read something, and he said that people are going to end up, and they're a representation of who they are. And I'm kind of... Uh, ad-libbing the uh, the quote, but he said when he read this specific quote, it jumped out at him, and it basically said if you keep doing drugs, you're going to end up a nobody, and you're defined by the person that you are, and he said that scared him, and that uh, that straightened him out, so an interesting show, I don't know how long it's going to last, uh, it may trigger a lot of different people, um, that's one of the ways I'm going to go in to listen uh, and watch it. Um, I still have to be careful if I'm seeing people, if I am in a mood watching a movie and somebody's doing cocaine, I don't, I try to look away because it still affects me. I couldn't be in the same room watching somebody do cocaine. That just, for me, that just doesn't. So, so let's check out your four. We'll, uh, we'll come back and we'll, we'll talk to you all about it at another time. So the, the main topic for today, and I'm going to set this up for you. So, so unbuckle your shoes, maybe take your shoes off, sit back on the recliner, relax a little bit. And I'm going to share with you a story, a story that, uh, kind of brings me to a knot in my stomach. Uh, 
brings me back to when I was uh, I was growing up. I was growing up in Yonkers, New York, and life life was nice. It was quiet. It was a safe area. It was back in the '60s and into the '70s, and and uh, it was beautiful. There were garden apartments. There was green hills and green playing fields and baseball fields, and stores and shopping malls and children all over the place. And, and it was just a good time to be a, a, a kid. And my childhood seemed fine. I grew up in these apartment buildings called uh, Bryn Mawr Ridge. And it was off of Central Avenue in Yonkers, New York. And I grew up with a younger brother. My brother was two years younger than me. And I had my mother and my father. And the way I knew life was my father was on the road quite a bit. My father owned a steel company. And he would travel upstate New York to Utica, to Albany, to Ithaca, to Schenectady. And there was a, you know, not the Industrial Revolution, but there was a lot of building going on. And my father seemed to be doing pretty well selling steel and going to construction companies and whoever else uh, he sold to. But it took a toll on the family to a certain extent. Now, when you're young and you're used to something, it doesn't bother you. You just go with what you're used to. So what I was used to was... My father would be home two or three days in a row. He would be home all day. And then he would go to work and he would leave on the road, his sales job. And my father would be gone, could be three weeks, could be three and a half weeks. And then he would come back home, be home for another couple of days. And then he'd go back out on the road. So that was the life that I knew that was home life. And I remember getting phone calls and being so excited to talk to my father. Uh, and that that was my life. Now, after it was it was January of 1969, it was, I believe it was a Saturday and it was very gray, winterish day. I remember our blinds were closed and it was about three or four in the afternoon. And all of a sudden, there was a loud knock at the door. The, it, it sounded like knock of a big man. And so I got up and I went to the door and I answered it. And it was a big man. It was a trooper and he took off his hat and uh, put it down to his side. And he said, son, is your mother here? And I said, yes, she is. Can you please hold on? I'll go get her. And he says, okay. And I guess my brother wandered over to see the state trooper. And I went into my mother's bedroom and I said, mom, there's a, there's a trooper here to see you. And she looks at me and she said, what did you do? I said, I didn't do anything. What do you mean, what did I do? So she brushes her hair, she's smoking a cigarette. She puts her cigarette out. She comes out. And the trooper says to my brother and I, can you two kids go into your room? I got to talk to your mom for a couple of minutes. So we just went into our room. And then as soon as we shut the door, we heard my mom yelling, and screaming and crying. And my brother looks at me. So I'm nine. My brother's seven. And he goes, daddy died. And. I don't know. I, I, for some reason, I didn't think that. But as soon as he said that, that, oh, that like just resonated and like, oh, my God, my father died. And so we sat in there, mother yelling, crying, and crying and crying. And what was probably a half an hour, but seemed like five hours. Uh, the policeman finally came in to get us and he took us across the street uh, or actually across the hall to our next door neighbor, Virginia. And uh, we stayed at Virginia's house for a while. And um, it was just a very surreal experience. Now, As a nine-year-old, you don't ask a lot of questions. So I was told that I was not going to the funeral. I don't know why. And um, at the end of the day, I found out later on, but it's something that you do not want to miss. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and we will be right back. 
Have you ever wondered why some children recover from their symptoms of autism while others never seem to get any better? After 13 years of research, Karen Thomas has recovered her own son from his symptoms of autism naturally. She now shares how she did it with you in her free webinar so that you can have the right resources and knowledge to help your child. The definition of recovery is to regain health. Karen offers this to you in four stages. Healing the gut, natural heavy metal detoxification, balancing the co-infections of autism, brain support, and repair. Register now for this free webinar to help you know what you can do to help your child to sleep better, be more calm, improve focus, and reach their fullest potential to live a happy, healthy life. Go to naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash free workshop empowering parents with the resources to naturally recover autism from a mom who's done it mj domit is the owner of expect to be empowered a company whose specialty is empowering people to live their best life by following their heart and accepting themselves unconditionally after studying and making personal changes mj now focuses on giving others tools for self-empowerment She provides individual and group workshops for people who are physically, emotionally, and spiritually blocked. Inspired by her work at Expect to Be Empowered, MJ authored the book Waves of Blue Light, Heal the Heart and Free the Soul with accompanying empowerment cards. She is a Spirit Book of the Year Gold Medal Living Now Book Award winner. And her book is a number one Amazon bestseller in spirituality and was a 2012 Gold Medal winner recognized as the Living Now Spirit Book of the Year. An inspirational speaker, MJ will show you how you can repurpose every area of your life. Your life did not just happen to you. You chose it, which means you can change it. Visit www.expecttobeempowered.com or call 866-264-8024. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show, live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and I am your host, Alan Charles. So before we went to break, I was telling you a little bit about what my life was like at nine years old, which kind of led into this very gray Saturday afternoon in January of 1969, where a state trooper came knocking on the door to tell my mother that my father died. Uh, My father died up in a hotel up in Utica, New York, and that was part of his territory. Um, I was told he died of a heart attack, and I'll just kind of leave it at that for now. Um, But at that point, my life that I knew it completely disappeared. At that point, my mother, the mother that I knew, totally emotionally checked out. Now, I had no idea to know what she was going through, and I later found out some of the trauma that caused her to act this way, but at the end of the day, here my mother is. Now, my mom was a big fashion model, uh, did some print model, runway model back in the 40s uh, into the 50s, and... uh, (laughs) <laughs> Back in those days, you know, besides doing the modeling, um, most women were stay-at-home wives, and that that was a very common thing. So when my mother and father married, my mom was a, became a stay-at-home mom, and so after my father passed, my mom didn't have a profession other than, you know, she graduated from high school, but she had her modeling and she didn't know what to do. So here she is left with a nine-year-old and seven-year-old. She has to get a job. The only thing she's able to get is a cashier's job. So she worked at like a bakery, a toy store, different places. Uh, minimum wage back then was like a dollar nineteen an hour. So we had no money. She was embarrassed and ashamed. Then she started. Uh, she applied for welfare. So I don't think she was allowed to work when she was on welfare. And then she didn't ha- wasn't getting enough money. And then she was embarrassed. So she was on and off welfare. So that was pretty much where. Everything was headed. 
let me tell you where I took over the household. So here I am at nine years old, and I don't know what to do. I walk to school every single day feeling the weight of the world on me. I didn't know what to think. I didn't know where my father was. As I shared, they didn't let me come to the funeral. So now I'm trying to think, is my father with God? Is my father in heaven? Or is he just in a box that they buried him in? And I'm not even sure of that because I wasn't even allowed to go. So I have no idea what's going on. So my mind starts to think, okay, maybe my father is with God. And as I walk to school every single day after I lost my father, I had this knot in my stomach. And I would think about things and I I would say to myself out loud, I'm alone on this planet and no matter what, I am going to be able to get out of any situation that I am in. No matter what, I can get through anything. I have no idea where that came from. I have no idea why I thought it. But all I know is every day I said that to myself walking to school out loud. And for those of you that uh, are familiar with the book called The Secret – I believe that I tapped into the secret at nine years old, and uh, that's a whole nother uh, topic for another day. But, uh, you know, so as I started to maneuver, here's the first thing that happened. It was about a week and a half after my father died. I always used to answer the door. So somebody knocked on the door. I went to answer it. Another gentleman probably in his 40s, and he looks at me and he says, can I talk to your father? And I said, "Um, my father passed away. How can I help you? And then he he looked at me again and he said, okay, let me talk to your mother. And I said, well, what is this about? And he says, your father owes us four months of back car payments. And I looked at him and I said, well, I guess we have a problem. My father is not alive. And he says, well, kid, do you have the keys to the car? And I said, well, if I give you the keys to the car, will that make all the payments and everything go away? He goes, yes. All we want to do is get the car back. I said, okay, you have to come back tomorrow. I'll talk to my mom about it, and then we'll let you know what we're going to do. Now, here's this 40-year-old man talking to this 9-year-old kid. He's probably got steam coming out of his head, or his head's rolling around. The God knows what's going on in But at the end of the day, he looked at me and he says, okay, kid, I'll be back tomorrow. So I went to my mother's room after I closed the door and uh, told her the same story that I just shared with all of you. And she looks at me and again, she's smoking her cigarette and she doesn't really make eye contact. And she just kind of just always looked so depressed. And she looked up at me. And she said, you do whatever you think the right thing to do is. And I said, okay, mom, give me the keys to the car. And she gave me the keys. And that guy came back the next day. I gave him the keys. And from that day on, I ran the household. So whether it was absent notes, signing a report card, uh, Whatever other needs, answering the phone, dealing with bill collectors, I started to take over that role doing everything. In addition, as my mom was struggling with money, I decided to go out and get a job. So I started working. Uh, I had two paper routes. I had a paper route in the morning and a paper route in the evening. Then I got a job working weekends where I I worked for this company called Wash Will Travel. and It was a mobile truck washing unit. And uh, I was getting $25 a day on Saturdays and Sundays. And I was basically between playing Little League Baseball. That was another thing that happened at nine years old. Um, I signed myself up. You're supposed to have your parents' signature and figured it was okay with my mom because I could do anything I want. So I signed the form. I signed myself up for Little League. So I had all of these things going on, all going on when I was nine years old. And now things start to get worse if they weren't bad enough. Three months after 
my father died. My brother got hit by a car. He was chasing to hang with me and my friends. And he yelled, can I come? Could I come? We had already crossed the street. And this is one of these things that I have been, oh, I have so much guilt about this. You know what? I'm going to save it till we come back for break. You're listening to the Alan Charles Show. You don't want to miss some of this guilt that I'm going to share with you. We're on Bull Brave Media and in Radio, and we will be right back. Dr. Rob Moyer is the director of the Ocean River Institute, and he is passionate about saving the ocean by helping dolphins suffering from nitrogen pollution. Nitrogen is a dangerous pollutant, affecting our oceans, altering ocean ecosystems, and contributing to global warming. The Ocean River Institute provides opportunities to make a difference and encourages people to go the distance for savvy stewardship of a greater and bluer planet Earth. Partnered with organizations from Massachusetts to Florida, Alaska to the Caribbean, the Ocean River Institute's mission is to foster involvement in conservation and environmental monitoring by facilitating grassroots efforts at local and regional levels. Hello, I'm Rob Moyer of the Ocean River Institute. Please visit our website at oceanriver.org. Sign up for free e-alerts. You may call us at 617-661-6647. Our email address is info at Ocean River. Become informed and then act with us. Thank you. Joseph A. Moylan is the owner of Ion Health, which specializes in very unique medical devices. Ion Health offers biomats, alkalife, and frequency machines. Biomats are a far infrared and negative ion emitting FDA approved medical device. With many different sizes available, you can place them on your bed, on a massage table, or on a seat in your car. It is an unobtrusive way to health. Alkalife machines are water ionizers that cleanse and raise the alkalinity of your tap water, making high alkaline water. Frequency machines utilize certain frequencies to kill viruses and bacteria. These devices are safe and effective. Coming from a health-conscious background and studying physiology at the Academy of Natural Health, Joseph A. Moylan has 15 years of experience in the health field and wants to help you live a healthy, long life. Visit www.ionhealthbiomats.weebly.com or call 765-520-2988. Don't let your health go astray. Get in touch today. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and Tune In Radio. And I am your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, I was about to tell you about this not in my stomach. And, uh, you know, I, I spoke about, I, I was telling you about the knot in my stomach and all the different things that happened to us as we are children. And we all get different things that happen to us. Some have trauma and some don't. Sometimes the trauma leads to, to lifelong problems, but it doesn't have to. Some of us grow up in unhealthy situations, and it's not our fault, but there is, that's the problem. A lot of mental health issues out there, as we tell you all the time, the addiction and all the other things are secondary. The key piece is this mental addiction, not mental addiction, but the mental illness problem that's underneath. So I'm here sharing with you my mental illness as as we're talking about what was thrown on me and how I basically lost my childhood at age nine. So not only uh, did things start to fall apart, my mother emotionally checked out, but now three months after my father dies, my brother, who's running after me, trying to hang out with me. We never had a relationship. He would always stay in the house. And and now that my dad was gone, he would want to hang out. So I was going across a a four-lane street across to a friend to get some ice cream. And my brother's tagging along, tagging along, and he's never with us. And And he couldn't keep up with us. And he yelled, can I come? Can I come? And I said, damn it. I looked back and I said, will you come already? And as he walked into the street, a car hit him. And I never saw the car. And here I am. I'm nine years old. 
I am beside myself. I'm laying in the middle of the street with my brother. There's a major traffic pile up. There's everybody's beeping. And I don't know if my brother's going to die or live. I don't know if it's my fault or not. And I am just beside myself. So I ride with my brother. Fortunately, or unfortunately, he did. He fell on his head and his hip, and he broke his hip bone. He was in the hospital for a couple of months. He ended up surviving. He got a full body cast. So when he came home from the hospital with his full body cast, our, we lived in a small garden apartment. It was a two-bedroom apartment. My brother and I shared. We had our two small beds in one room. And then, obviously, my mother and father had the uh, their bedroom. And so what ended up happening is my brother came home in his full body cast, and my mother gave him her bedroom. So then my mother comes in to sleep with me in the single bed, in my brother's single bed. And I look at her and I'm like, what are you doing? And she says, what do you think I'm doing? There's no reason. This is a perfectly good bed. And I said, yeah, but I'm not sleeping in this room as my mother. There's no way. And so she said, well, there's a, there's a couch outside if you want to go sleep on it. So that's what I did. I up my stuff and I went into the living room and the living room if the apartment was 300 square feet um, there was nowhere to go I basically went into the open middle of of the apartment and uh, and that became my bed and I stayed on that bed I was nine years old and I stayed on the couch until I was 17 years old and went away to college I had no privacy. Everything was out and late. I had all my stuff under the table. I had my other stuff under the couch. And that's what I lived like. I had my own little area and there was no safety at all. So here I am. I have no guidance. I'm left alone. My mother's abandoned me. I have my father's side. My household now is starting to get worse. Dysfunctional. Ugh. They could have put my household next to the word dysfunctional. So my brother ends up um, starting to get some mental illnesses. Uh, it's before, I guess, they gave them names and it got popular. But uh, my brother was right there with OCD. And uh, we had uh, one bathroom. And my brother would go into the bathroom. He would take a, a toilet, let's a whole roll of toilet paper, Scott toilet paper, and a bar of soap, coast soap. And my brother would wash and God knows what for hours. And if you hadn't gone to the bathroom, luckily, before he went in, you're not going anytime soon. He refuses to get out. My mother has no control. He'll destroy the door or break the sink if you try to get in and this progressively got worse and worse and worse where my brother realized that he could manipul manipulate my mother any way that he wanted to so for instance if he wanted money and my mother came home and let's say she had thirty dollars in her wallet and my brother asked for the money, my mother had to pay a bill or we needed a food or something, he would start screaming and yelling and breaking things until she gave him every penny in her wallet. And he had, she had to show him that it was everything that he got. This went on just about every single day for years and years years I just could not take it so I needed to stay out of the house as much as possible because it's always yelling and screaming if I was home then I was well, I was doing something so my brother was yelling and blaming me uh, I can remember him breaking my my black and white television set I would, I would come every night to watch the Yankees and for two months I had no money I didn't have that television set thank God I had a radio and I listened to them I was being tortured and uh, then my brother started to not go to school he started hanging out with the wrong people he 
In those days, they were referred to as the greasers, and they had tattoos, and they were smoking pot, and they were cutting school. And my mother was distraught. She had no idea what to do, and he was going another way. And I found all different ways to stay out of the house. And when we get back, I will share with you all these different ways that led me down oh, some amazing adventures. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and Tune Radio. We will be right back. Do you ever wonder why certain things are happening in your life? How to start a business or a new direction? Need answers? Astrologer Bonnie Perbula can help you reveal your true self and gain strength and focus so you can achieve greater joy and success. Working with a natal birth date, time, and location, Bonnie brings out qualities to aid you in getting the best from your life. She can help you unlock dormant traits to bring you greater awareness. Bonnie also conducts public speaking engagements to educate aspiring astrologers on their journey to the stars. A gifted artist, Bonnie bridges her talents and recently launched a line of Astro Bears, uniquely created in colors of individuals' astrology charts. She also makes one-of-a-kind necklaces of crystal beads and woven thread. To learn more about the world of Bonnie Prabula, go to BonnieGPrabula.com. And for astrology consulting, visit AstrologyConsultants.com or call or email her at 808-526-1536 or BonnieGP at AOL.com. Baby boomers face many challenges, and sometimes you have to reinvent yourself in order to stay on top. Sharon Ball, nurse practitioner and Christian life and wellness coach, can help. Sharon has written a book called Reinventing Yourself Today, and it can help you through the pangs of changing the course of your life. Whether you are looking to stay on track with new goals, a sensible program to help you shed unwanted pounds, or a full kick-butt life reinvention, Sharon can work with you. Follow your passions and live each day according to your dreams and free yourself from the expectations of others. Sharon comes from the heart and shares her own personal journey to reinvention with her clients. Other self-help books inspired her, but few gave her the steps to improve her life, so she created a plan that works. Stress no more. Let Sharon Ball open the door. Sign up for a complimentary life reinvention consultation today at tinyurl.com forward slash get started for free for more of what life has in store. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. I am your host, Alan Charles, and I am your guide to beating addiction and winning your life back every Thursday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So tell your friends, anybody that may have, you think they may have a problem, turn them on. Turn them on to our show here. Bring them in. Let's talk to them. Let's see if we could help them. So before we went to break, I was uh, finishing up on uh, this toxic and dysfunctional uh, childhood that I grew up with. And uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy. So as I was sharing, what I was looking to do now is, I mean, it was bedlam. The police were being called to our house every probably twice a week um the walls were paper thin i grew up in this garden apartment and we had uh five other families in the building it was a six six building apartment so the walls were paper thin and if you put your ear on a wall you could hear everything in the next house um and if you talk just regular you could just about hear them and if somebody's screaming forget it. it it's like you were in their apartment and that's what my brother did and he would scream and he would yell and he would bang and we literally would have banging on every single wall and then banging from the floor because we were on top of somebody so they'd have their broom banging to shut the f up up there so it was bedlam the police were at our house a couple of times a week my brother was breaking walls windows pulling the the uh, door off the hinges i mean it, it was just ridiculous so 
I had to find ways to stay out of the house. So right away, what I shared with you was I started to work. So here I am at 12, 11. I've got a paper route that I do at 6 in the morning, the daily news. And uh, then I go to school. I come back home and I do my Yonkers Herald Statesman route. That was an afternoon paper. Then I would either run back. If it was baseball practice, I'd go back to baseball. And then um, – I started, I fell in love with harness racing. Now, harness racing is where you're not the jockey on the top of the horse. You actually are a person that sits behind the horse in a race bike or what they refer to as a sulky. And I started going every night in high school. I did not want to be in my house. So between baseball, my jobs, and harness racing – I stayed out of the house as much as possible because of the craziness. And then finally, when I escaped to go away to college, this is something that, that kind of shakes me to my core. So, so I want to I want to share it with you guys. What ended up happening was I got I went away to college and I went away to play baseball. Uh, I I. Ended up applying to all of the top baseball schools in the country. Now, I had no guidance. That was stupid. I should not. I didn't have the talent to play at the University of Miami or the University of Southern California or Arizona or Arizona State or the University of Florida, which are the five five schools that I applied to. And I got into four of the five. And since Miami was the number one country, uh, number one uh, team in the country in baseball, uh, that sounded like a good place for me to go. So I go down and work out, and they basically tell us that if you don't have a scholarship, because the freshman team was made up of guys that had scholarships that aren't on the varsity team, because the varsity team is made up of all scholarships. So they're basically telling you, if you don't have a scholarship, you're not good enough. And they didn't make believe to say it. They specifically said, if you don't have a scholarship, you should here because you're not good enough to play at the University of Miami. But what they did say is they had um, that they had to have mandatory tryouts and they had to at least open two positions on the freshman team to somebody. And there were about 140 or 50 people trying out. So to make a long story, I was pretty damn good and I made the team. So it was awesome, and I worked out, and I played hard, and I was on the freshman team at the number one baseball team in the country, the University of Miami. So it's winter break, and the reason that I'm telling you this story is because this is going to end the situation at my home for me, as I knew it before. So I shared with you how I lived on that couch. What I didn't share with you is that every night when I went to sleep and that the war zone that it was, I would come home late enough from the racetrack hoping that everybody was asleep because otherwise it'd be yelling and screaming. And if I had gotten home and my brother was still up and as I walked in the door, he would yell, who the F is that? And get the F. Start yelling and screaming and saying all kinds of crazy things. Finally, when I was ready to go to sleep... I would get on my couch and I would make sure that the covers of the blankets were tucked in around me. And then I would pull the covers over my head and I would pull my knees up into my chest and I would roll up into a ball. I would put my hands over my ears, both ears I have covered and I would just rock back and forth humming some unknown song just something to make noise and I would go and that is how I would fall asleep every single night so here I am coming back to college and I'm kind of I have a knot in my stomach I called my mom every week when I was down in at the university in Miami. Some weeks I would get her and I'd be able to talk to her for a couple of minutes. Most weeks I would call. My brother would answer. 
and I would say, can I talk to mommy? And he would say, no, F you, and hang up on me. And then I didn't get to talk to my mother that week. So here I am. It's the winter break. It's the second beginning of the second week of December in 1977. I have this big suitcase, and I'm on the second floor, and I'm walking up the staircase, and I knock on the door. And all of a sudden, my mother opens it. But she only peeks out. She's very close to the door and peeks. And then all of a sudden, my brother yells out, Who the F is it? And my mother turns and talks to him and says, It's your brother. And we're going to break. When we get back, you're going to hear what my brother said. And from that point on, I never lived in that house again. You're listening to the Alan Farrell Show live on BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and we will be right back. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like... I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Welcome back to the Alan Charles Show, live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And I'm your host, Alan Charles. And before we went to break, kind of left you on a a cliffhanger. So here I was, uh, went away to the University of Miami and escaped the dysfunctional, horrific destruction of my household that I grew up in. So it's winter break. I'm coming home my freshman year. Uh, We're on the second floor, and I've got this big, heavy bag, and I'm excited because I'm going to be working out for a few weeks, and then I'll head back to college. And as I walk up the stairs and I put this bag down, I knock on the door. And my mother opens it up, but she's like peering out from it like like she doesn't know who it is. And she sees me, and I see her, and she, she looked gaunt and Oh, it just did not look good. And I go, hi. And she says, hello. And she didn't move like to let me in. And then all of a sudden, my brother yells from the bedroom, who the hell is it? And my mother says to him, it's your brother. And then my brother yells out, he doesn't live here anymore. Get him the F out. And then my mother looks at me. And, and I'm like, I'm, I'm in shock. I'm in shock. I, I never thought like that this was something or even a possibility. It never entered my mind. And my mother looks at me, and all I can see is tears running down her cheeks. And she said, I am so sorry, but I can't let you in. You know what he's like. If I let you in, he will destroy the house. And then she shut the door on me. I stood there with tears coming down my eyes. I didn't know what to do. I picked up the suitcase and I walked back down the stairs and I sat at the bottom of the stairs. I couldn't even go outside. And I put my hands over my face and all I did was sit there and cry. And then I, I, after, after I had a good cry, I got up to my cousin, Alan and Nancy's house. And, um, 
they lived in Yonkers, and fortunately, they let me stay on their couch, and uh, uh, back to school I went, but uh, that was the last time that I ever was, uh, that I guess I tried to sleep at my house again. That, that was it. So here I, I shared with you for most of the show the toxicity toxicity of my situation and growing up and there's so much more to my story um i can tell you that uh my father didn't die of a heart attack and if you wanted to go read the book because that's uh um probably a big big piece of it so you might want to go pick up my book, Walking Out the Other Side, Natick's Journey from Loneliness to Life. And any of these toxic relationships, it doesn't mean that you're going to have this horrible life or a horrible situation or have a mental illness. Toxic relationships make us all unhappy. They corrupt our attitudes. And it, it's, it just makes for unhappy relationships they prevent us from realizing how much better things can be so some of the things we have to do as we start to get better or to to not think about these things is we have to redefine our expectations and to identify what works for us it was a tremendous show and i appreciate everybody being here with me tonight uh, next week, we're going to be doing a remote from Florida, and uh, since we'll be in Florida, I will share with you a story about how I ended up in a Lake Osceola, which is in the middle of the University of Miami. You're listening to The Alan Charles Show live on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio, and we will see you next week. He used to be an addict, now he's substance-free. Telling all about his crazy journey. This has been the Alan Charles Show with your host, Alan Charles. The views and opinions expressed by Alan Charles and guests on the Alan Charles Show are solely their own and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the BBM Global Network or its affiliates. Even though Alan Charles thinks he's an expert at life, we urge you to think about acting on his advice. Even though he has been in recovery for 10 plus years, he is a bit of a mashugana. He's given us the real story, the Alan Charles Show. Ups and downs, losing jobs and the glory, the Alan Charles Show. He helps others avoid that purgatory, the Alan Charles Show. been listening to the bbm global network the ideas views and opinions of this broadcast are those of the participants of the program and are not necessarily the ideas views and opinions of the bbm global network company